But then the cartel called in the cavalry, with music blaring and phones filming, gunmen with machine guns and rocket-propelled grenades raced to the rescue. They deployed a 50 caliber machine gun that's so heavy it's attached to the back of a truck. And the mayhem began. For more than four hours, cartel militia members and Mexican soldiers fought in the streets and paralyzed Culiacan. Hugs and not bullets, he says. And what happened uh, yesterday simply shows that the Mexican state and his government in particular are failing at their mission to pacify the country. He is simply re reproducing the failed strategy of his predecessors, which was to go after uh, drug kingpins with the hope that that would dismantle cartels, and all it produces is further violence. Even Culiacan's airport came under attack. Terrified flyers huddled together after their plane was hit by gunfire. I was filming when the Air Force arrived here at the airport, and they were met with bullets. My mouth is dry. I'm super nervous. Just about everyone is familiar with the name El Chapo, the title given to former Mexican drug lord Joaquin Archivaldo Guzman Loera. During his reign, El Chapo ignited fear throughout multiple countries, regulated an incredible amount of trafficking of illegal drugs into the United States, and killed mercilessly and callously. But once El Chapo was finally captured and locked away for good, his four sons were eager to take his place. These young men, like their father, are formidable, powerful, and unforgiving. Perhaps the one that is the most evil out of the bunch is Ovidio Guzman Lopez. Ovidio has been known not to hesitate to use deadly force against anyone who attempts to take him down, including law enforcement. This is the story of how Ovidio took down a man named Officer Eduardo Triana Sandoval in one of the most brutal and shocking attacks in Mexican history. Now we know that Mexico has a pretty violent history. In fact, in recent years, it has had on average around 26,000 murders a year. So keeping this in mind, the fact that this particular incident is known to be one of the most brutal crimes in history is really saying something. Eduardo Triana Sandoval was a very well-respected member of the elite Mexican police force. The way that he died was completely and utterly shocking to the entire nation. The 32-year-old's murder occurred on October 17th of 2019. He had just been finishing up a typical shift on duty and was preparing to head home. Unfortunately, he would never make it back to his family that evening. Just as Eduardo was about to pull out of the parking lot he'd been sitting in, a vehicle pulled up alongside him, catching him off guard. The next thing he knew, the occupants of the vehicle had all opened fire on him, spraying him with bullets. He didn't stand a chance against them. And just like that the officer of six years was killed. It was said that over a period of 60 seconds, a total of 155 bullets were fired at him. This horrific attack was actually captured on CCTV footage, where you can literally see the last few moments of Eduardo's life. CCTV cameras captured the horrifying moment when at least two armed men with semi-automatic rifles climbed out of a red car and opened fire at the late cop's white Nissan four-door sedan. In less than 30 seconds, at least 150 bullets were fired, and the trigger-happy killers had accomplished their mission. There was no way Eduardo could have made it out alive. Pandemonium hit the streets, and reports began flying over the radio. According to these reports, Eduardo had been shot over a hundred times in what the media was now calling a brutal car park execution. As you can see, the red vehicle quickly pulls up alongside Eduardo's white four-door sedan, and two armed men, wearing masks, get out. They are both holding automatic rifles and begin firing at him repeatedly, before eventually jumping back in the car and quickly driving away. Eduardo's vehicle was absolutely riddled with bullet holes, and a medical examiner would later confirm that while not every bullet that the attackers fired struck Eduardo, he had been hit at least over 100 times. This was an incredibly savage and incredibly brutal attack that this young officer never saw coming. So we know that El Chapo's son, Ovidio, was the one behind the attack, but why? What had Eduardo done to him? that made the drug lord's son decide to take these incredibly desperate measures to get revenge. Eduardo Sandoval had previously worked for a security detail team that was intended to protect the deputy secretary of the Sinaloa Secretariat of Security and Civilian Protection. Essentially, this is agency of Mexico's government that was intended to protect the public's safety from dangerous threats such as the cartel themselves. 
but because Officer Eduardo had such an elite role within the organization, he had a target on his back. Usually, with a high-ranking position, like the one that Officer Eduardo had, there are certain precautions that will often take place to help protect officers' lives. But sadly, once the cartel decides that they want someone dead, there's not a lot that can be done to stop them. Eduardo was ruthlessly targeted and killed in what the media termed a brutal car park execution. Eduardo's death sent a very clear and gory message to the Mexican public, just as it was likely intended to by Ovidio and his gang of thugs. When someone tries to take steps against the cartel, they put themselves on a path that will likely lead to death. Nobody is safe, not even law enforcement officers themselves. Cartel de Sinaloa, the origins. Upon further investigation, the authorities discovered that the Sinaloa cartel, one of Mexico's most powerful criminal groups, may have had something to do with the gruesome shooting. Established in 1987, the Sinaloa cartel, otherwise known as the Guzman Zambada Organization, the Pacific Cartel, the Federation, or the Blood Alliance, ranks high among the most prominent international organized crime syndicates in the world, and it specializes in illegal drug trafficking and money laundering. So why exactly was Eduardo targeted when there were so many different officers who had participated in initiatives that were aimed to try to take down the Sinaloa cartel, the cartel that Ovidio Guzman Lopez was running at the time. Well, just a few weeks before Eduardo's graphic murder, there was an infamous operation called Black Thursday. This was a massive planned raid aimed at capturing Ovidio. The hope was that by taking down the Sinaloa cartel's leader, the Mexican government would have better success in destroying the cartel altogether. But unfortunately, the operation did not go as planned and was actually pretty disastrous. Violence and chaos spread throughout the nation, and it didn't accomplish the goal that it was intended to. While Ovidio Guzman Lopez was briefly apprehended, the cartel's reaction to his capture was beyond anything the government was prepared for. They were swift and incredibly violent in their attempts to get revenge, and things got so serious that the government was eventually forced to release Ovidio to prevent more people from being killed. The Mexican state of Sinaloa erupted into violence Thursday as police captured and then released the son of drug kingpin Joaquin El Chapo Guzman. The failed raid has called into question the Mexican government's ability to contain drug violence. Nick Schifrin explores what this says about the capabilities of the United States' top ally in the fight against illegal narcotics. It's truly shocking just how much of a colossal failure this whole operation was. They had El Chapo's son, the current public enemy number one, behind bars and in custody at last. This was something that they had spent months and a huge amount of resources trying to accomplish. But yet, because they were not equipped to fight back against the cartel's response, they had to set free the man who they knew was playing a role in actively destroying so many lives. It was truly a nightmare. The descent into chaos played out on social media. A phalanx of Mexican security forces deploy to a neighborhood controlled by the powerful, locally-based drug cartel and capture their target, Ovidio Guzman Lopez, who now runs the family business built by his father, known as El Chapo, Mexico's most infamous drug lord, now in a U.S. prison. The government surely should have expected that the cartel wasn't going to allow their leader to be locked away without a fight but nobody seemed to be prepared by just how far they were willing to go. But then the cartel called in the cavalry. With music blaring and phones filming, gunmen with machine guns and rocket-propelled grenades raced to the rescue. They deployed a 50 caliber machine gun that's so heavy it's attached to the back of a truck. And the mayhem began. For more than four hours, Cartel militia members and Mexican soldiers fought in the streets and paralyzed Culiacan. They didn't even bother to wait until nighttime, but began to wage war in the middle of the day. Burning vehicles and dead bodies filled the streets, and the violence didn't seem to be stopping anytime soon. At least, not until the cartel got back what they wanted, their leader. For residents, it was absolutely terrifying. They fled for their lives, this woman carrying her baby in her arms. And on a nearby road, a father shields his daughter. Daddy, can we get up? She asks. No, my, amor. No, my love, he says. This level of violence is stunning, even in a country known for violence. And it's never happened in this city. All of this chaos was happening in the capital of Sinaloa State, a place where El Chapo had been running the cartel for many years, even while on the run for much of this time. Throughout everything, 
Mexican and U.S. officials had worked hard to keep the peace and did so, for the most part, successfully. That is, until now. And as residents searched for safety and the gun battles mounted, the cartel took soldiers hostage. And that's when the government released the kingpin they'd captured, having achieved nothing except for the death of eight people. Today, Mexican President Andres Manuel López Obrador defended the decision to retreat. As you can probably imagine, the decision to release Ovidio Guzman López after all of this effort was considered largely controversial, but it was one that the Mexican president claimed he felt he had no choice but to make for the sake of the innocent Mexican people. The capture of one delinquent cannot be worth more than the lives of people. Las vidas. I think what happened in Culiacán was a big mistake for the López Obrador administration on all fronts. Tactical, strategic, it evidences the contradictions of his efforts to pacify the country. Mexican political analyst Denise Dresser says that Operation Black Thursday was essentially a copy of what the Mexican president's predecessors have attempted to accomplish in the past. In 2006, newly elected President Felipe Calderón officially declared war against the cartels. Armed forces began conducting deadly raids. They publicized their spoils, parading kingpins and weapons, and showing off contraband. The operations weakened the cartels, but also set them against each other and increased overall violence. This violence has come in dramatic forms throughout the years, including an incident in 2014 when 43 male students went missing after riding on a school bus to attend a local protest. Only three of those students' remains were ever determined, and the others are presumed still missing, and their loved ones left behind have made it clear that they won't soon be forgetting about them. Every anniversary, demonstrators call to end the violence, and that frustration helped get López Obrador elected. He promised to be different. You can't fight violence with violence. You can't put out fire with fire. You can't fight evil with evil. And while the Mexican president may truly believe this, many Mexicans believe that his approach is not working. Hugs and not bullets, he says. And what happened uh, yesterday simply shows that the Mexican state and his government in particular are failing at their mission to pacify the country. He is simply re reproducing the failed strategy of his predecessors, which was to go after uh, drug kingpins with the hope that that would dismantle cartels, and all it produces is further violence. Upon further review of Operation Black Friday, many have pointed out that there were a lot of pretty major errors and poor planning involved. Soldiers launched the raid with no arrest warrant and apparently no plan for extraction. And by failing to achieve their objective, the cartels become stronger, Dresser argues. The more that the López Obrador administration proceeds with these ill-conceived attempts to, uh, to seize drug kingpins and then backs away, it's sending the message to cartels that they can basically do what they want. The aftermath of this horrific ordeal was absolutely devastating. Today in Culiacán, they saluted the caskets of slain officers. And police family members grieved for the husbands and fathers who'd been killed. But they were also angry. They shouted down the local governor, saying he'd sent their family members to the slaughterhouse. He vowed their deaths would not be in vain. But today, the kingpin is free, and the cartel still runs the city, just as it did yesterday. So the question is, what is the government of Mexico's path forward now, and is it even still possible for them to dismantle the Sinaloa cartel for good? While they have certainly made progress in fighting the cartel since this catastrophe, there is still much work to be done. As history has clearly shown time and time again, destroying a powerful cartel is extremely complicated because when one leader is killed or arrested, another one will typically take charge pretty quickly. We've seen this happen before in the Sinaloa cartel since its creation back in 1987, also known as the Guzman Zambada Organization, the Pacific Cartel, the Federation, or the Blood Alliance. It is notorious for its involvement in illegal drug trafficking and money laundering. The insane amount of money that this cartel possesses makes them virtually unstoppable and very difficult to control. Nearly all of the trafficking organizations and violent crimes in Mexico have their origins in the region. At the time of their inception, these organizations were, in the very sense of the word, a small group of farming families that lived in rural parts of the state trying to survive. 
In the 1960s and 70s, things took a turn for the worse. The once peaceful farming families moved into the wicked trade of drugs, particularly marijuana. And of course, where there is illicit money, there is death. The cartel has deep roots in the Mexican state of Sinaloa, a region long known for its history of violence and contraband. Initially made up of small farming families in the 1960s and 70s, these groups eventually shifted to the drug trade, particularly marijuana. Over time, they expanded their operations to include heroin and methamphetamine, leading to increased violence and the emergence of powerful drug lords. Pedro Aviles Perez was one of the early prominent figures in Mexico's drug trade. He was most famous for using aircrafts to enhance his ability to smuggle drugs. He was ultimately killed, though, during a shootout with law enforcement in 1978. Nevertheless, his legacy was proven to be quite powerful because he had taken the time to train so many others to follow in his footsteps while he was still alive. Some of these figures included people like Rafael Caro Quintero and Miguel Angel Felix Gallardo, also known as the Godfather. Gallardo founded the Guadalajara Cartel, one of the largest criminal organizations in Mexico during the early 1980s. The Guadalajara Cartel's downfall in 1985, following the murder of a U.S. drug enforcement agent, led to the fragmentation of the cartel into smaller factions, including the Tijuana, Juarez, and Sinaloa cartels. Out of all that violence arose the notorious drug lord Joaquin El Chapo Guzman, or Shorty, to his friends, who founded the Sinaloa cartel. Cartel de Sinaloa, the peak of power. El Chapo and his vast drug trafficking empire have been in existence for a little over three decades, and they've remained in the spotlight, so one can only imagine the kind of influence they command on the streets of Mexico. To this day, Cartel de Sinaloa remains extremely influential, and still dominates much of northwest Mexico, and the entire country. Then came the reign of El Chapo Guzman himself, the man who would prove to be even more powerful and formidable than those that came before him. Under El Chapo came a period of severe violence as he dominated the drug trade and founded the Sinaloa cartel. The cartel really grew and flourished under his leadership, becoming more powerful than ever before. Taking down El Chapo would be no easy feat, and it took years. The collaboration of both the United States and Mexico, and several attempts. This time, El Chapo stayed under the radar until 13 years later, in February of 2014, when the Mexican authorities tracked him down to a condo in the beach town of Mazatlan, in his native state of Sinaloa. After being arrested and publicly hauled away in handcuffs by Marines, it took only 17 months for the drug baron to be free again. He escaped his high-security cell in Mexico's Altiplano prison in June 2015 with the help of a 1.5-kilometer tunnel that's one mile for our American friends dug out by his henchmen. Despite multiple arrests and escapes, Guzman continued to lead the cartel until his final capture and extradition to the United States, where he is currently serving a life sentence in a maximum security prison. If you thought that would be the end of things, or that El Chapo being locked away would really even slow the cartel down, shockingly, you would be wrong. Despite El Chapo's imprisonment, the Sinaloa cartel remains highly influential and active even now. They operate not only in Mexico, but also in various international markets, including major cities in the United States, Buenos Aires, and beyond. This cartel absolutely dominates the illegal drug trade and continues to actively smuggle multi-ton shipments of narcotics across borders and maintain a network of dealers, kidnappers, and assassins. Their annual revenue is estimated to range from $3 billion to $39 billion, proving how much it truly controls a major portion of the global drug trade. Since El Chapo was hauled away to prison for what will likely be the rest of his life, his sons took over for him. They are known as Los Chapitos, and aside from Ovidio Guzman, there is also Ivan Guzman Salazar, Alfredo Guzman Salazar, and Joaquin Guzman Lopez. However, there have been several new advancements about taking down Los Chapitos for good. After the Mexican government's horrific failed attempt to take and keep Ovidio Guzman in custody back in 2014, they've since made another attempt. This attempt was made on January 5th of 2023 by Mexican authorities, and this time, it was successful. A city under siege. Across Culiacan in Mexico's northwest, gun battles with security forces and more than a dozen roadblocks. The work of Mexico's largest drug gang, the Sinaloa Cartel. The outbreak of violence follows the arrest of senior member, 32-year-old Ovidio Guzman. The son of drug kingpin Joaquin El Chapo Guzman. But this time, 
the Mexican government would not be backing down. He was arrested more than three years ago, but after a deadly backlash was released on the orders of Mexican President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, an embarrassing setback for his administration. This time, Mexican authorities aim to keep him in custody. The detainee was transferred from the place of his arrest to Mexico City in an Air Force aircraft. Both the Army and the National Guard were called in to help assist with the violence and chaos that broke out in the wake of Ovidio's arrest. Even Culiacan's airport came under attack. Terrified flyers huddled together after their plane was hit by gunfire. I was filming when the Air Force arrived here at the airport and they were met with bullets. My mouth is dry. I'm super nervous. In their desperate fight against the drug crisis, the United States set a whopping total of $7 million in reward funds for information that would lead to the arrest of Ovidio Guzman. This was a crucial step in the right direction towards the efforts of taking down the highest members of the Sinaloa cartel. El Chapo's son Ovidio put on a private plane with a one-way ticket to Chicago. This 33-year-old son of the Sinaloa cartel kingpin tonight at the federal lockup in downtown Chicago after a court arraignment on drug trafficking and money laundering. Ovidio pleaded not guilty to the charges against him and was supposedly surrounded by federal officers when he was led into the courtroom. From the beginning, he was considered a high-threat prisoner and was kept under careful surveillance. After all, if he's anything like his infamous father, he may be planning an escape. Following Ovidio's not guilty plea, his lawyer publicly stated that the son of the most notorious drug kingpin did not intend to testify against his other family members. He's not planning on cooperating against his brothers. Attorney Jeffrey Lickman initially brushing aside questions about whether Ovidio Guzman Lopez might help himself by cutting a plea deal and assisting U.S. drug agents in tracking down and apprehending his three fugitive brothers. This son, I possibly could see it. Following the successful takedown of one of the older sons of El Chapo, many speculated that the pressure would be mounting against the three other brothers as well. They likely knew that their time could also soon be coming to an end. Even in our days with Chapo, a public enemy number one, that was a tremendous embarrassment to the Mexican government and also to the business community, both in Chicago and across the border. So I think there's going to be some unique pressure to clean this mess up and get these other three in custody. And pressure there certainly was. Ovidio Guzman's public attorney said that he had seen where his client was being held and said that he considered it to be far more humane conditions than the conditions that El Chapo is kept in around the clock while serving his life sentence. While Ovidio has not yet faced trial, if he is convicted, he is likely looking at anywhere from 10 years to a maximum of life in prison. There's a good chance that he will be serving out that sentence in a Colorado Supermax prison. While Ovidio is currently still in jail awaiting his fate, he will soon learn that he might be seeing one of his own brothers behind prison walls in just a short time. This is due to new developments that happened in late July of 2024. Tonight, two of the world's most powerful drug lords are in U.S. custody, including the son of former kingpin Joaquin El Chapo Guzman, both charged with flooding the United States with drugs like fentanyl and cocaine. It was yet another massive win in the fight to dismantle the Sinaloa cartel. CBS's Manuel Bohorkas reports that federal agents used trickery and deception to make the arrest. This photo obtained by CBS News shows 76-year-old Ismael El Mayo Zambada, a leader of the Sinaloa cartel, just before he was duped and apprehended by U.S. law enforcement after a months-long operation to capture him. El Mayo supposedly believed that he was flying to see property in northern Mexico, but as soon as he boarded his flight, he was instead flown to a nearby airport where he was promptly arrested by U.S. agents. But El Mayo wasn't the only high-powered Sinaloa cartel member that federal agents managed to capture during this operation. Supposedly, it was Joaquin Guzman, the son of El Chapo, who lured El Mayo into this trap in a shocking act of betrayal. Guzman was also arrested, the reason he cooperated not immediately disclosed. The Justice Department will not rest until every single cartel leader, member, and associate responsible for poisoning our communities 
is held accountable. So why did Joaquin betray a fellow Sinaloa leader? And why is he all of a sudden seemingly cooperating with U.S. authorities? That reason doesn't yet seem to have been revealed. The men are accused of running one of the most powerful and ruthless criminal organizations in the world. The DEA says the Sinaloa cartel generates billions each year and is the largest supplier of synthetic drugs like fentanyl into the U.S. It's helped fuel an overdose epidemic. Nearly 75,000 Americans died from synthetic opioids last year. El Mayo has already entered his plea, which was not guilty. Joaquin Guzman is expected to face a judge to enter a plea of his own within the week. What will that plea be, and will he decide to throw other members of the Sinaloa cartel under the bus? Only time will tell. But one thing is for certain, the two sons of El Chapo's that remain in large are probably beginning to sweat. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to like and subscribe for more.